I would like to be able to go back and give you the background of what I'm going to do because it would help you understand how this thing came to pass. When we talk about the reevaluation, the reaffirmation of elders, you know, immediately when I hear something like that, as I did years and years ago, I thought, oh, what, what are we talking about? Because I'm kind of digging and finding your term. I don't have a problem with the evaluation and reevaluation and affirmation. Those are good terms. But when people begin to use them in application or applying them to a certain matter, then they can change what's going on. <laughs> so when I hear a reevaluation and reaffirmation of elders, I begin to scratch my head. I want to know, what do you mean by that? Now, I mentioned Brother Lavelle earlier. I said, I'd better put on the route and lay the groundwork because i got to follow you. Well, I think you did, and I appreciate that. The whole problem that we're dealing with, and this is true of where the people are binding by their doctrines, things old men, the Bible doesn't bind, are loosing by their doctrines. From men, those things the Bible binds. It all comes down to lack of respect for God and the authority of His Word. Amen. Never did it. And to substitute what we want, but we do so well with that, rather than what God wants. The whole thing is the spirit. The spirit came. Saw it. It was set right there in the beginning. Right there in the beginning. The difference in Cain and Abel. They didn't respect God. They didn't respect His offering. When I say they didn't, I mean Cain. And of course, Adam and Eve set the example of doing as they pleased. Well, if you were to look at the situation and the way we're going to do it is simply look at Dave Miller's sermon. He was like, "What does he believe about this?" You know, one of the best things to do to find out what a fellow believes about anything is to go to him and ask him. Now you say, man, I'll tell you the truth. Well, here was a sermon he preached. And it was transcribed, and we read it in the August 2005 issue of Contending for the Faith, pages 10 through 14. You can go see what he said because he preached the sermon to convince the Brown Trail Church that this is scripture and right and all be done. So I can learn the definition by reading that a sermon that the elders at that time said, you ought to preach because this is what we're going to do. We've got to show everybody why it's all right to do it. Well, it's interesting, too, that when you read the history of the church, we all have seen this, that by 150 A.D., the biggest apostasy step that laid the groundwork for all others was that one elder had more authority than the other elders. And uh, that led to all other kinds of problems. You have in Acts 20, Paul warning the elders that from among your own selves from men arise, teaching perverse things, perverted doctrine. And they did it to get a following. And if you will just look at all false doctrines, you'll find that uh, most people advocating them won't follow. They're promoting number one. Well, the Bible has much to say about elders and their authority and their work, and elders who love the truth, who live the truth, who preach the truth, who know their work as elders and do it, are worthy of the highest acclaim and encouragement. And I've been a gospel preacher working under elders far longer than I've been an elder. And I said that when I had no idea of ever being an elder because it's the truth of God's Word, the Bible teaches it. And all those who are faithful in the church will uphold faithful elders who are qualified to do the work of the church. Well, there was a problem in the church at Brandon Trail. And I'll just simply sum up by saying it was in the eldership. This was back in 1989. There were about uh, eight elders. We'll say four of them were sound in the faith, four of them. And uh, in time, a couple of them, well, actually one resigned due to health, and then two others fundamentally were forced out. And that left the men who were not walking the straight and narrow way in control. But each time this happened, a number of members left the congregation because they didn't like themselves what was going on. And we could go into a lot of detail on that, just don't have time. But this led to after, well it led into 1990, to where um, the people were upset and what had been discussed in the eldership and you had the church in the quandary. So there was uh, the move made for David Miller to preach a sermon and he did on April 8, 1990. Concerning the, and it was under the authority of the elders. In other words, he preached it because the elders authorized him to preach it. 
And uh, that's the one we have to continue for the day. Now I want to look at this sermon as best I can the time a lot. And one point that stands out when you read the sermon is simply the lack of biblical evidence for proof for doing what they did. Now I'll pause here and say it's my understanding and if I'm wrong I appreciate somebody telling me that the, at least the present elders, and I don't know how far that goes back, at the Brown Hill Congregation in Hearst, Texas, I no longer believe this, but uh, uh, Dave Miller does. He's never recanted. He's never taken back what he preached up there that day. Never has. Now, there's at least three people, uh, two of them in this congregation, I say this congregation, this assembly, who call Miller to talk to him directly. And they know what kind of answer they got. Wayne's not here, but he did too. And they're not the only one. And the various answers you got never was this. I was wrong. The doctrine I preached was wrong. I repudiate the doctrine. I repented of that sin. And I've asked the brethren to repent of it. Now that's when you know somebody has changed, at least by his words. Well, I've never heard that from Dave Miller. So I can only know what Dave Miller believes. And what they practiced on the basis of the sermon they authorized explained to the congregation what they were doing trying to say the Bible is behind it. But he doesn't give. When you read the thing, you see. Um, he starts off by saying, we are people of the book. And we believe, and I'm quoting, that whatever we do in religion and life must be authorized and guided by the Word of God. Well, that sort of sets the scene. But when you go through the thing, he doesn't really help any Bible support for what they did. You'll understand better what they did later on. Um, he gives Bible authorization for the office of the work of elders. And that's all, all well and good. He cites specific passages, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, Acts 20, 1 Peter 5, uh, to point out that uh, there is such a thing as an eldership the way it's supposed to be, but that wasn't what was in question. And then he says, but how are these men appointed, quote unquote? And then he comments and says, you know, the Bible, quote, is largely silent in this matter, unquote. But then he turns right around and says, and I'm quoting again, the Bible has a great deal more to say about the matter than most brethren realize. Now, I have trouble putting that together. The Bible is pretty much silent about it, but then the Bible has a lot more to say than most brethren realize. He uh, tells us that the specifics or details are not spelled out, but the principles are provided for us. He does correctly deny the false doctrine of evangelistic oversight where the preacher controls the whole thing. And uh, then what he gives seems to be, as he says, and I quote, an inspired selection process given by the inspired apostles. Now, he cites Act 6 in the selection of those men to serve tables as a guideline for appointing elders and deacons, for that matter. Um, he says that if we're to look among ourselves, that's all right. On what basis? Are we just to say, I like you, you're a good guy, you're here all the time, you've got a good personality, uh, you're an elder and so forth like this. Well, that's just not the way it works. You've got to have a standard to go by. When those apostles who stood in the place of the New Testament told those brethren back in those days, look you out among you, they gave a standard for them to use and apply to each man to see the qualified. And today you have those qualifications for deacons and elders. How does the Holy Spirit make deacons and elders? Same way the Holy Spirit makes Christians. When you comply with the Spirit's word regarding those qualifications and you meet them, and then as elders you do what God says elders ought to do, or deacons, or that matter a preacher, or for that matter a husband, or for that matter a wife, basically. This is what we, we heard this morning. You have Bible authority which you believe in practice. Do what God said, do it the way God said, do it for the reason or the one reason God said, do it. And he said when to do it. <laughs> That's how you know you've obeyed a commandment of God or complied with His authority. All of that is fundamental and ought to be ingrained in the minds of every person, as Brother Lowell so well pointed out. 
So they look among themselves, but there's a standard to follow. And uh, there are the qualifications. Uh, notice what he then states. Quote, if that be the case, brethren. Now it bothers me when he says, here's, your, here's what I think is an inspired example of how you do this. And then says, if. Before I can give you what I ought to give you, it shouldn't be if. It should be that is the way that it is. Imagine me sitting up here and saying, now if we find that a person must believe, and if we find that a person must repent, and if we find that a person must confess faith in Christ, and if we find people are baptized in Christ, then that's what we ought to do. If you do find you do find the plan of salvation. You do find the steps of the plan of salvation. And so it is when it comes to whatever we're talking about, and especially this. So if it is the case, brethren, the implications are enormous. If it is the case, he ought to be sure before he starts talking about that. If indeed uh, this is intended to be what he calls a prototype, that is the Acts 6 account of appointing those men to serve tables, if this is intended to be New Testament authority, there's that if again. If it's intended to be New Testament authority, which uh, we have for making selection of officials within the church, i continue to quote, when it would be wrong for the preacher to make those selections, and it also follows it would be inappropriate for officials to make those selections. Did you understand that? What he's actually saying, if you've got this prototype, though, there's the uh, prototype, then that sets a pattern for us to follow in the appointment of elders and deacons. Why? I think it was you, Bruce, last night, that made it very clear that just because you have an example, a pattern, that thing in and of itself doesn't exclude other teachings or authorization from the Bible. Doesn't at all. So he bases, now this is what I want to emphasize right here, he bases his whole idea of reevaluation and reaffirmation of elders on if this and if that, and if this is a prototype, then we should be doing that. But he never does say conclusively, this is the New Testament direction for us to deal with things along that line. So he says it's a prototype. But it's based upon supposition, according to his own words. If that be the case, if indeed this is intended, if this is intended, Biblical authority is not based on assumption, but biblical evidence and proof. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Now, Miller then tries to offset what he sees coming. If you have the whole thing in front of you to read, and especially if I had time to give you background of the trouble in the eldership, then it would make more sense than it does just reading it as just a sermon to prove something. But it's sufficient for us to notice what we need to. He says, someone, I'm quoting, says then that you're saying then that elders and leaders are to be selected, are to be selected by majority vote. Well, that's not exactly what I'm saying. You notice how this could be, might be, not exactly. Well, maybe. That does make a lot of sense. I'm quoting him. I'm not telling you what I'm thinking. I'm just reading what he thinks. His thought, for him, his words. And people say, what does he believe about it? Well, all I can do is give you what he said that he put together himself. And he preached to prove it was right. Now, he says, not exactly the, uh, that it's to be a majority vote. But he then mentions that one must meet the qualifications. Then he turn, returns to the idea of majority vote. You know, if a man meets the qualifications, majority vote isn't doing it. If a person is obedient to the gospel and meeting each step of that <coughs> salvation, what do I think so have to do with it one way or the other is whether he's a Christian. He is a Christian. To obey from the heart that form of doctrine. The Lord had him to church. The Lord knows his heart. And he's a member of the church. What have I got to say about it? You want to vote on him? Some churches do. So he goes ahead to say, and I quote, it seems to me that that does not make it majority vote, so to speak. It's not a popularity contest. Well, he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. He says, here are the qualifications God set men must be. 
On the other hand, he wants to get men's viewpoints in there as to who ought to be in the ownership. So he's saying that, yes, we've got the standard whereby to determine qualifications to be met. But where he's heading is meaning that the people, and you're going to see this, that the people have a say in who is going to be elders regardless of the qualifications they meet or don't meet, as the case may be. He leaves the door open, is what we're saying, for a majority vote political outfit. And that's going to be vital as we go on into this. Now having established what he assumes to be the process by which elders and deacons are to be selected, he then turns to the reevaluation and reaffirmation. Now notice, they've been evaluated, or they wouldn't be where they are. But now we're going to reevaluate. Let me ask you something. When Paul said concerning general Christian living, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the thing, unless you be reprobate or rejected. Is that not something that goes on with every faithful child of God, elder, deacon, preacher, member of the church? It goes on regularly that evaluating yourself in the light of the truth. Do we not evaluate one another in the light of of the totality of truth bearing on the subject. By their fruits, you shall know them. Try the spirits to see whether they be of God. For many false prophets are going out in the world. And Jesus commended the church in Ephesus in the book of Revelation for having tried those who say they were apostles and found them not to be liars. So there's a constant evaluation going on. Elders, if they're what God says they ought to be, are evaluating themselves. Each elder is evaluating the other elder. Now, on what basis? The same thing that made them elders and what the Bible says the work builders are. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to say, certainly not, that you have to be an elder and go to heaven. If, if such is the case, I, I've only been going to heaven a little over a year. That's just not true at all. And uh, uh, we must understand that point so that we're not... We're not saying that uh, a person couldn't step down as an elder. Several things could cause that to happen. So keep that in mind. So then he goes ahead to establish uh, this is supposedly a biblical practice. Now his first proof is that over the years, and you follow me closely here, over the years the complexion, the complexion of a congregation might change. Well, I have to start saying complexion. What do you mean by that? I want no definitions. What's your viewpoint? What are you trying to tell us as far as the congregation changing? Well, he argues, quote, if the members select elders to begin with, unquote, then if the, quote, complexion of the congregation in terms of its membership can change over a period of time, over a period of years, unquote, then the present <coughs> membership might select the same men, might not select the same men, too. In other words, as different people come in, and we've all seen that's been a member of a congregation for a long time. Uh, some go out, people die, people move, others move in. And that's what he means by complexion. The men that are in the eldership now are selected by people no longer here. And there are people here who didn't have a say in the appointment of those men as eldership. So the complexion has changed. That's, his, that's one of his proofs for saying we're going to reevaluate those men as elders. And either we're going to affirm them to remain elders or we're going to say, no, you can't be anymore. Uh, he tries to say that he's talking about the view and saying it's false, the false view, that once an elder, always an elder. Well, I want to say something about that because if a man is qualified to be an elder, or let's say an eldership period, because that's what it takes, not just one man. But if all the eldership that was appointed, say, 20 years ago, but basically a congregation starts, and when congregations were starting many years ago, you had this happening all the time when elders were appointed. So they put in, say, three, in, as they used to say, install three elders in the new congregation. Okay, the thing goes on for 20 years. Same three elders are there. If they're qualified, they should remain there. And if they're doing the work of the elders, they should remain there. 
Tell me how you remove somebody that's faithful to the calling that he's doing. Now, so in that sense, yes, once an elder, always an elder. If he is always qualified and doing the work. You know, it's like saying once saved, always saved. Well, that's true if you're faithful. You know, just because um, people apostatize doesn't mean you have to. Now you can. You can be overtaken a trespass and refuse to repent of it. You're going to be lost. You die unrepentant. And so it comes down to the idea of a man's qualified to be an elder and appointed to be an elder, and he's doing the work of an elder. Why should he be removed? This is a question I'd like to ask. Tell me why should a person like that be removed? I don't know why he should. Because he's qualified and he's doing the work of the elders that all of them are doing. <coughs> what the elder seems to forget is that when a person becomes a member of a congregation, that person is placing himself under the oversight of men who are elders. They are, in effect, saying, uh, I'm accepting these men who are elders of the church, and I am submitting to them as a member. That's what he seems to overlook. That's what the congregation does. You think about going, well, I'll take Jack. Jack was a member of Spring. I have to put Brenda along with him. So, <laughs> and they were members of Spring. Jack, you searched for the elders. They were under the eldership there. They moved up here. They placed the membership here. That helped change the complexion of the congregation just a teeny bit. So therefore, Jack, you should lead a rebellion and try to run these fellows off because you had nothing to do with them being elders. Now, do you see what this is coming down to? We, it, it's making it more and more a political thing. And you'll see that more as we go. So Miller's idea is just fallacious, contrary to the authority of the Bible, as all these other innovations are. He then states, conceivably a man... That, that Follow me here. Conceivably, and I'm quoting, a man could meet the qualifications, brethren, and yet not be perceived by that flock as a shepherd. Not be a man to whom they will submit themselves. Well, if they will sin, go to hell. I don't know. That's, that's their business. And the church should draw fellowship from them. Uh, the whole thing out here is here's God's will. You can choose to believe and obey it and serve God out of love and faith in Him and based on His Word. <coughs> or you can reject it. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. But He's using this in a sermon to persuade the church that the reevaluation of Reformation Bill is all right. Let me just read it again. Conceivably, a man could meet the qualifications, brethren. And yet not be perceived by that flock as a shepherd. Not be a man to whom they will submit themselves. Now this is a man who had been preaching a long time. And is now heading up Apologetics Press. He's never recanted these things. And yet those of us, and I lived through a bit of this. All the way back to 1989-90. And was quite involved in a lot of it. And yet people thought people like me were the meanies. Some people who had stood very strong against other innovations, but on this one, they had to, which way is the wind blowing with my money and where it's coming from and my friends and who's going to get me a job and who's going to keep me. And they can deny that all they want. That's exactly what it was. I remember the time when if this had been said... And it was, by the way, at the time. This was in 1990. And the word went out, and I was directing the school over at Austin at the time, and letters came from here and there, basically put out by Global Music. And I don't know all the soul and the people that knew about it that said, oh, that's right. Every church ought to do it. It's authorized by the Bible. They condemned it swiftly. But when it was practiced by them in 2002, and then some of us rose up to deal with it, it was another story all together with who's on whose side and who props up who and who's going to hurt who. And it caught a lot of people that thought they were faithful, but they found out they weren't. I like to think about what Brother G.K. Wallace said about the rich young ruler. said, good master, what must I do to hear eternal life? And the Lord told him. And the scripture says he went away sorrowful because he had much riches. The Lord had told him to give all his God and follow him. <coughs> And Brother Wallace used to say, here's the record of a young man 
who just thought he wanted to serve the Lord, but he found out he really did. And that is exactly what life is all about in this world. When you choose to obey the gospel, you're putting yourself in, in front of the devil's firing squad. And he's going to work you every way he can, either through your wife or husband or your children or your work or your whoever, and especially in the church itself. They're going to do this kind of thing. And didn't the Lord warn us that from among uh, our own families, what, what do we learn from that? And when it happens, it always comes to us in a way that we can't make the application that we made every other way. And that's what happened over there. Now these folks doing what they did when they became members, they understood they were placing themselves under those eldership. And thus they perceived themselves to be under those shepherds if they perceive to be shepherds. So it gets rather strange when somebody says perceive. Why should I want to perceive what the Bible says? Can we do that? Can we actually perceive the meaning of the words God gave for the express purpose of guiding us? You know, my perception is my reality. But I better make sure my perception conforms to reality. If not, who knows what's going to be. You, you never know. And yet you see the wiles of the devil in putting this thing together as it is. So technically qualified, he says, but not qualified. One could conceivably be technically qualified, but if the people won't follow him, he's not qualified. So then it's the people who are determining whether the man is qualified scripturally or not, whether they're going to follow him. Well, if he's qualified, tell me where the authority in the Bible is that authorizes a faithful child of God not to follow him. It doesn't make any sense. Especially when you got Hebrews 13 and 17, obey them to have rule over you. What does that mean? Obey them to have rule over you. What it really means to a lot of people is that when I'm happy with it, when it suits me, when I think they're right because they did what I thought was right, then I'll do it. Well, you know, that's not submitting yourself. Submit means submit even when you don't necessarily think that's the way it ought to be because elders do so much of their work, if not most of it, in determining options as to how to carry out the obligation. They can't change the obligation, but they're trying to figure out what's the best way to discharge the obligation as far as the congregation is concerned, and that's their work, besides keeping the church following those obligations. Well, he then gives an example that if 20 or 30 percent of the congregation thought he was saying, this is his own words, quote, a dumpy preacher, unquote, that he would leave. How long would faithful preachers stay in any congregation, whether it's today, 10 years ago, or 50 years ago, if with about 20, 30 percent of the people said they don't like the preacher? Well, that's just going to happen. I don't care if it's 50 members, 100 members, 500 members. There's going to be some members not going to like the preacher. The laundry stays, the more they're not going to like it. Now, if you ask them, why don't you like it? Write down point one. I don't like him because. I don't like him because. Well, is it a sin he's committed or is it not a lie? Well, whatever it is, it's going to be that way. So I guess, according to him, in view of what he lays down as to the reevaluation and reformation of elders, that if you apply it to preachers, then I'm going to have to be reevaluated and reaffirmed by the membership, regardless of the elders, <laughs> to find out whether I'm a, a dumb preacher. We can have fun with that, but we won't. <laughs> what is interesting is that numerous people did leave the congregation, that is the Brownville Church, prior to this first implementation in uh, 1990. And even more left when they implemented in 2002. You never hear much about that at the time, especially. But this has no real bearing on whether or not a congregation should practice R and R. None whatsoever. But it gives us a, an additional qualification, a qualification that's nowhere found in God's Word. And listen to it again. Quote, what follows then that one of the qualifications of a shepherd is that the membership perceives him to be so? and is willing to submit and to follow to respect and to trust. 
If a man's qualified, if you notice the qualifications of elders, it's saying this man is a fully mature Christian. Fundamentally, that's what it's saying. He's been tried. He's proven that he's been able to do the things that would allow him to be in such trust of the church. And that he is doing those things God says elders are to do. Now, if I'm being under elders, and I am if I'm where there are elders and my membership's there, what should my perception be to people like that? Are they qualified? Yes. Are they doing the work of elders? Yes. Well, then what should my perception be? It should be Hebrews 13, 17. That we are to submit ourselves to. If not, then tell me where we would go to get the attitude and perception we ought to have. This is simply adding to God's revelation to all it's due. Those qualifications are in there. That's what he's come up with. He then comes to passage dealing with those who were presently elders. Paul's writing 1 Timothy 5, verse 20, 19 and 20. Against an elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. Now he correctly states concerning these verses, and I quote again the principle here is that even though man is in a position of being an elder in the church, he can disqualify himself or make mistakes that he shouldn't make. It therefore follows that a man may be removed from the office of an elder. Whoever that knows his Bible would say no to that based on this passage. Then he correctly observed, I quote, we have the process of doing so. There has to be also two or three witnesses. If charges could be sustained against an elder being disqualified, he could be removed. Now, right there is where y'all started and stopped. And that's right where it is. If a man's qualified and he's appointed on the basis of qualifications, and he's doing the work of an elder as the Bible sets it out, he ought to get away by the congregation. If the elder sins and there's one, uh, two or more witnesses, then let it be established. And if the man refuses to repent, deal with him like you would anybody else who's engaged in sin and refuses to repent. How does that set him apart? Because he's an elder from the corrective disciplinary teaching of the Bible. As far as I know, it doesn't. It might make it even worse because of the example he's supposed to be, but all Christians can be the example of one to another regarding a living Christian life. Paul says, follow me as you see Christ living in me. Should we all be able to say that? But especially the shepherds of the flock. Seeing they don't get the message of uh, 1 Timothy 5, 19 and 20. He said that... Uh, well, we should observe at least, and not come back to this. The dean correctly states that all that is needed for an elder to be removed is two or three witnesses of sin in his life, uh, in view of the fact he won't repent, of course. Not 26% of the congregation's vote. Now, you hold that in your mind for a little later as time allows. He claims that's all we're talking about. That's his words. Well, that's all we're talking about. Again, he claims, quote, the principle is that if the membership finds fault with an elder, the membership who put the elder in the first place can remove it. That doesn't exactly say what Paul said. Paul said sin, transgression of the law, and two or three witnesses to prove it. That's when it's to be received. But the process that he brings out does far more than this. It eventually sets forth a process by which they vote on the elders, and those elders get a 70, if they get a 75% approval rating, they remain elders. I'd like to know how that's in harmony in 1 Timothy 5, 19 and 20. Where do you find that? I'll be like Brother Lavelle and say, where's the example? Where's the direct statement? Where is it implied? That's just adding the word of God to all that is. And the Lord didn't like that too much. Goes ahead to say, I would still maintain that a man could theoretically be qualified and yet have lost his standing with enough of the members that he ought to voluntarily remove himself. Now, how do you determine that unless you ask the members how they perceive the man as an elder of the church? Now, you see where he's getting the reevaluation. Remember, you have to ask the members. And that's where he's headed with the sermon. 
Going down on I-2, he set out the procedure that would be used. And they had forms that would be used in the process. Here's what he said, quote, there will be two types of forms. One of these forms will give you an opportunity to simply state whether or not you think any of the five men who are now serving the eldership should or should not continue to serve. You won't be asked to sign that form. Well, I think Phil ought to sign it. He's going to be that bold. But why should there be a form in the first place? The last comment was changed possibly because they realized that it sort of sounded like stepping in the ballot box. And trying to impress the congregation with the seriousness of that, listen to this, they realize what this is sounding like. And trying to impress the congregation, he cannot escape this voting aspect of the whole process. So he says now, quote, and you've got to realize the time which this was going on, may you not take this lightly. This isn't like running down and voting for Clayton Williams. This is serious. Now what is, he, what is going on in his mind to make him make a statement like that? He's thinking about the voting process. He knows it involves each member voting uh, who they think ought to be and ought not be, whatever. And uh, there are two forms, and I don't know how time will allow me to do this, that, that we'll concern ourselves with. Um, I'll go and you throw a rock at me. Uh, well, don't throw it too hard, will you? <laughs> First of all, the rational form, biblical rational form, States one, the members select the elders to begin with, that's six three, so now he's back on his uh, prototype. Since the complexion of the congregational membership changes over the years, remember how we how you set that out, and the eldership may conceivably no longer consist of the same individuals whom the present membership would select. Two, shepherds cannot lead where sheep will not follow. They sure can take those sheep to the sale barn and get rid of them. Even if a man is technically qualified to be an elder, if the membership where he attends does not perceive him as a leader whom they respect and trust, he cannot shepherd effectively. Three, the Bible makes provision for the evaluation of an elder's spiritual standing. 1 Timothy 5, 19. Well, how's that figure into anything? It doesn't support top side, bottom, or edge of what they're advocating. Should a current elder be found to be disqualified, he no longer meets the qualification of an elder. An evaluation process is simply one expedient means of ascertaining the elder's conformity to God's will. Now that's what some of these folks are teaching. The President Director of Memphis School of Preaching says, oh, this is just an optional way of determining where men are still elders. Well, that's just not true. It's just false. It's false can be false. Because uh, they're usually once an elder, always an elder it is... False, because they say once they would always say, well, we've explained all of that. But they throw this in the mix to try to say this is what we're doing. Elders have the authority, he says, point four, to ascertain the amount of confidence that members have in their leadership capabilities. Any shepherd who genuinely wishes to serve the flock or naturally desire the continued approval and respect of that flock. Should an elder no longer sustain that respect from a sizable portion of the flock for whatever reason, the only proper attitude would be to remove oneself from a position that depends upon credibility. Listen, folks, if a fellow is qualified to be an elder, as the Bible finds those qualifications, and is doing the work of an elder along with his fellow elders, tell me why he not, does not have all the credibility he needs. A Christian does not have to be an elder to go to heaven. Well, what does that have to do with anything? So in looking at these four points, we've already examined two of them, and time I don't think is going to allow us, um, what time is that, five minutes? Actually five minutes. Well, then we'll look at something a little more here. Let me uh, notice the elders must have the respect, trust, confidence, and support of the congregation. And the shepherds cannot leave <coughs> The sheep, they won't follow. Here is uh, the little thing they handed out. It's a card. It said, my evaluation of, and there was a place where you put the elder's name in. Then the next statement is, I have reservations about this man being an elder at Brown Trail. And it's a yes or a no. And then, please express your reason or reasons for your decision. And so you can write it down there, signature. Now, did you notice something that's missing from that? There is nothing about the scriptural qualifications mentioned on that call. You know, 
it's, if an eldership is what it ought to be, as I was finding that. And somebody thinks that an elder is in sin, and there's two or three who are witnesses. Mind you the meaning of the word, word witness. And they come before the eldership, and they lay this out about one of the members, one of the elders. Isn't that the way it ought to be done with anybody? As long as it's just not public for all to see. I realize the elders stood in the pulpit and said we're moving in the mechanical instrument of music into the worship next Sunday. That would be a private matter involve everybody. But the point is, whatever is wrong, would you want to deal with the sin? Certainly. So it ended up being a vote on whether the individual wanted this person to be an elder or not. And that's a popular vote. It's a popularity contest. It throws the whole thing into a matter of politics. Can you imagine the promises that elders would make is to stay in office? If you're going to have the look, look, kind of, look, at, look at the kind of people that would gravitate to the office. And yet, if you remember all the teaching in the New Testament about what an elder is to be and not to be, it rules that kind of thing out. The Bible protects the truth on the matter. Now, um, when they instituted this process, the congregation had filed elders. Johnny Ramsey announced the mandate, quote, of the congregation. On May 6, 1990, after the invitation song, Ramsey made the announcement that two of the five present elders had been, had been reconfirmed. And after his announcement and prayer, one of them that hadn't been, uh, he didn't receive 75%. He uh, got up and resigned. The other two didn't, but they ceased to be elders. It's just a hard part. I'm going to have to move real quickly on this. Problems, if you have seen enough already, with the... Uh, R and R. Here's where it all begins and ends. And this is all you need to know. There's no authority for it. Here. That ought to stop it right there. People say, why don't you use a mechanical instrument of music in your worship? There's no authority for it in the New Testament. Why do you partake of the Lord's Supper and the assembly of the saints and worship on the first day of the week? There is authority to do it then and then only. That answers all of it if you're mindful to apply Colossians 3.17 to everything you think, say, and do. All we got to do in the world, there's something to say, do we have the Lord's authority as expressed in His Word as a language communicates any authority to anybody? Do we have it? And if we do, fine. If we don't, no. That's so simple. Now see why I said it started, as I said at the beginning, right back to how painted and they wore, and the attitude of Cain, and the attitude of Abel. Um, second point is false. Uh, well, at least uh, we, we won't even touch that anymore because that's the, with, with the authority business. Now, the 75% approval rating leads to another problem. And which showed itself when they used this process later in 2002. How do you determine the 75%? Is it going to be 75% of the congregation or just the ones who return the form? Which might be a much smaller number than the congregation. Should a husband and wife be considered together or separately? The children have the opportunity to vote. Children who have been baptized, all children, or children of both certain age. These questions certainly become a problem if you're going to jump on them doing a man-made outfit, as it always does. One error <laughs> leads to all sorts of other errors. Another problem is uh, they placed a committee over the elders. The elders actually placed a committee in charge of this thing, over them to control them until the process was over. Where do they get the authority to do that kind of mess? Thus, the elders become subject to the committee, and that just is wrong and wrong to be. Well, what if a man doesn't meet the qualifications of being an elder, but he gets 75% approval? I guess, you know, they perceive him to be an elder, whether he's qualified or not. He got seven stops of approval. He's an elder. Now, do you understand why the church got itself in a mess early on in the apostasy, beginning even before the first century was over with? That's exactly what happened. These folks are walking in the same path those folks did 2,000 years ago that led to ecclesiastical authority. It's exactly what happened. You know, the devil doesn't, doesn't change things very much. He just knows people are too stupid to read history. They don't have respect for God and the Bible. He just does what he always does. There's always somebody there running over. I'm sorry this has been kind of sketchy because there's so much stuff here we take the rest of the day on. 
But I hope it's clear enough that number one, this idea is false. And then they're qualified and they're appointed and they're doing the work of the fellow elders that the Bible says they ought to do, then we're to submit to them. And we're not to set up any kind of process that allows for it to be a political mess to where anybody in his half-sister dog and lizard can vote and say, these I perceive to be elders. Are they qualified? No, but I perceive them. Because I can tell you right now, it's like Brother Wood said a long time ago. Somebody says, why does the Church of Christ believe on this? Brother Wood said, that's a wrong question. You should be asking, what does the Bible teach on it? Because you can find anything and everything that people believe in the Church of Christ, right and wrong. And until we get back to the respect of God and His Word, we're going to do all what's authorized. For we say is authorized by the language of the New Testament because we're not going to do anything but that, Colossians 3.17, then we're going to see more and more stuff slide up. And who knows what that will be. Thank you for your attention.